Did you know that there is a Stargate cartoon called Stargate Infinity? It exists! And that bland, factual statement is the nicest thing that I can possibly think of to say about it. Stargate Infinity was created in 2002 as part of the popular Stargate science fiction franchise. An online plot summary says that the cartoon takes place roughly 30 years after the original movie. So, since the movie was made in 1994, that means that the cartoon is set in the year 2024. Fortunately, and <laughs> you'll understand why I'm saying fortunately in a couple of minutes here, but fortunately, Brad Wright, one of the original Stargate showrunners, says that Stargate Infinity is not canon. For whatever reason, MGM did not involve any of the creative team from the original Stargate series in the work on the cartoon. Which is certainly a choice. I wish that I could play the entire unintelligible Stargate Infinity theme song for you. But I don't want to get dinged for copyright. So in order to just set the tone, here is a snippet. Well, my ancient so long ago, the Stargate lay till we broke the code. Fighting evil through the galaxy, Stargate Infinity. My favorite part of the theme song is the fact that if you listen closely, you can hear the Zat Gun sound effect. For no reason. I could only ever bring myself to watch three episodes of this cartoon. And then I had to watch them again in order to make this video and pull clips. I have not seen the rest, and I will likely never see the rest. But if I do my job here today, then you will never have to watch them at all. Right up front, I can tell you that no characters from the Stargate TV series are present in this cartoon. In fact, nothing in this cartoon is modeled in any way after the Stargate TV series, except for the actual Stargate. The characters, and let's see if I can remember the names of this godforsaken team, are Major Gus Bonner, his niece, Stacy, uh, a woman named Seattle, a completely useless excuse for a human being named Harrison, an alien named Echo, and Draga, who is a character that we will get to a little bit later. So the first episode opens with some cadets running through morph drills in a futuristic ATV. Their sergeant provides instruction while flying overhead with a jetpack. Just like Stargate! And they're also wearing these colorful armored plate uniform things. Just like Stargate! The theme song shows a shot of Paul Langford finding the Stargate. They categorize planets with numbers and letters. And an order was given on PR-6308. There are weapons that look sort of like Jaffa staff weapons. I mean, these are just all the most important components of Stargate right here. They fight with guns that shoot a green laser beam. Uh, they have colorful hair and face tattoos. Wow, so representative of the American military. This is what a court-martial looks like. I may be new to command here, Major Bonner, but I respect the challenges of off-planet duty. Is there anything you would like to add in your defense? Wow, I never knew. We don't get to see the SGC courtroom in the live-action series. It's not even a good cartoon. It's not clear at all from the first episode what the premise is. And with that in mind, is this show for children? Are the writers assuming that these children have already watched 
Stargate? And if the children are old enough to watch Stargate, why don't they just watch Stargate? Like, what do children think is happening here? Do they even know what a court martial is? You don't even really need to know the general plot of this episode slash series, but I'll just explain it to you anyway. Uh, Major Bonner is framed by a shape-shifting alien for sending his team into a trap. Bonner is court-martialed. Meanwhile, the SGC finds this chrysalis thing that they think contains an ancient and a bunch of evil aliens who are related to uh, Bonner being framed. They invade the SGC because they want to take the chrysalis, but Bonner and a team of, I guess they're cadets, um, take the chrysalis and then they escape through the Stargate and then they gate around to different planets trying to escape the aliens who are pursuing them because they want to get the chrysalis and then it eventually hatches and you find out what's inside. I feel like this show was made by people who researched Stargate the same way I half-assed book reports in high school. You read the first chapter, you read the last chapter, and you read a random section in the middle. And then whatever conclusion you draw, you just present it with confidence. It worked for The Great Gatsby. It doesn't really work so much for Stargate. In the first episode, they show an Egyptian-styled sarcophagus, and they say that they found it in Egypt and Giza, uh, near where the Stargate was found. Stargate Command believes the sarcophagus may contain physical evidence left behind by the ancients who built the Stargates. Well, well, no, no, it's Egyptian in design, so it would have been left by the Goa old. They discover that the mummy has a fried shrimp inside of it. And knowing what I know about the Goa'uld, I was worried that that was going to be a symbiote. But nope, stay tuned for that twist. <laughs> this scene seems like both a direct reference to Alien as well as something that would potentially traumatize a child for life and linger eternally in their subconscious until such time that they become an adult and make a YouTube video about it in order to deal with the trauma. Ghost writer. Oh, and there's this horrifying visual. At one point, they state that the fried shrimp thing might be the key to identifying the ancients. That creature could be the key to learning the identity of the ancients and finding their home planet. But, but, no, the, we see the ancients in Stargate, SG-1 and Atlantis, and the, they were the first evolution of this form. They weren't fried shrimp. So... This is an ancient. What? No, it's not. See, uh, what's wrong? And suddenly I felt like I was moving. Like I was going down a corridor. This one girl named Seattle is psychic. This is normal and accepted. Both her supernatural ability and her name. Harrison is completely useless. Just utterly incompetent. At one point, they're trying to save this large stone artifact from falling into a mud pit, and Harrison goes to help. And instead, he falls into the mud pit. So they have to divert resources from saving the artifact to saving Harrison. Whoa! Whoa! Harrison! <sighs> <sighs> They should have just let him die. Gus Bonner is both a military officer with the rank of major, as well as what seems to be an anthropologist 
with detailed knowledge of all of the aliens on these planets that he's visited, as well as at least a basic understanding of their language. Gus Bonnergood, shoot blood on touch, total. And it's not just me that calls him Gus Bonner, calling him by his full name. Uh, a lot of people do as well. Gus Bonner. Gus Bonner. Gus Bonner. Gus Bonner. Gus Bonner. Gus Bonner. By the way, this is what was inside the fried shrimp chrysalis thing. <laughs> it's Draga, the newest member of their team. She looks more like my old math teacher in high school. <laughs> we called her the Dragon Lady. The Dragon Lady was named Ms. Niederhoff. Da -da. There's one random thing that bothered me the entire time. Um, why is the entire floor of the gate room a grate? Like, that just seems inconvenient. It would be hard to walk on. It would be hard to, like, wheel carts on. If you drop something small and it goes through, then you have to, like, crawl around underneath and find it. Did the people who made this show maybe just mishear people in the TV series saying gate room and thought that they were saying great room and just then made the entire floor a, a great? The second episode has these little cute gerbil aliens and of course, Harrison, being just a disaster of a human being, crash lands into one of their huts. <laughs> and there's a baby gerbil alien inside. Gee, I, I hope I didn't hurt him when I crashed. My thorn's a little rusty, but I think the kid was already sick. Oh God, you almost killed a baby? But you think it's fine because he was already sick? They discover that Gus Bonner had a cold the last time he was on this planet, so the sick and dying cute gerbil aliens are probably his fault. What about before the mission? Did you show any symptoms? Well, I felt kind of achy. And you didn't report it? I'm old, I get achy! You know what? I, I do feel that. The sick gerbil aliens make me sad. I don't like it. The dialogue in this show is so weird. Hit him off at the pass. Okay, forget it. The music cuts out. What? What is this? Harrison, the ceiling! I'm glad Harrison knew what Harrison the ceiling meant. The thorn are dying and smart money says it's my fault. I know, I know smart money is a phrase, but it just feels very flippant here in the context where they believe that they've potentially killed off an entire race of cute gerbil aliens. I had actually assumed that Echo was a robot, but now he's bringing up his mother. The survival of all free planets, including my mother's, could depend on it. And then he also brings up his mother again, about a minute later. And then in the next episode, he brings up his mother again. Okay, Norman. I sense it understands that we're friends. <laughs> this is me with every animal. I'm staying. When I was a girl on the reservation, I hung out with an old healer. Maybe I learned something. Maybe you learned something? You think there's just some random knowledge that you picked up by accident that's rattling around the back of your head that you can use to help these sick gerbil aliens? The healer taught me that sometimes there's nothing you can do. Oh! Okay, then. Where are we going? Somewhere. Wow. I'm setting the Stargate for a place I haven't been. Setting a destination on the Stargate. They keep saying that, and it's just off enough 
to just be like nails on a chalkboard for me, you know? I don't want to hate on the voice actors. They didn't write this thing, but their delivery just doesn't help. Give me that! What? Look, I will say that this cartoon, it has a lot of action and high stakes and peril and adventure and they do travel to different planets with certainly very different types of aliens. So, I mean, I'm not the best judge of children's entertainment. Maybe a child could enjoy this, but I doubt it. The best thing about this show is the episode descriptions on Tubi, where you can watch this show for free if you feel so inclined. You won't. Um, let me read some of those episode descriptions to you. I'm going to try to hold my iPad, like, out of frame. Harrison must learn not to judge a book by its cover after finding a female alien disgusting. This is actually the third episode. It's the one where Harrison falls in the mud pit. And the female alien that he finds disgusting saves his life. And based on the established rules of their culture, this means that she now owns him. Do a click him, Bogwin. <coughs> What'd she say? She said you're hers now. Huh? And the rest of the team, including Gus Bonner, is just kind of like, well, that's it. It's their custom. What can we do? Uh, everyone else helped save me, too. It was her rope. And then, because these episodes can't even have some sort of satisfying moral lesson... I think Bogwin's sad to see you go. Well, that makes one of us. If I never... Huh? She's... Beautiful. Harrison learns the error of his ways in not judging a book by its cover when he discovers that the disgusting female alien is actually hot. Okay, here's another episode description. Stacy has arachnophobia and mistakenly injures a spider-like alien. That sounds like a description from a weird babysitter's club book. An amphibious alien overhears Harrison bragging about his swimming ability. Alright, that's an episode? Seattle adopts a cuddly creature that grows into a 200-pound problem overnight. That's actually how I felt when I adopted my cat. Anyway, if your favorite part of Stargate was just the word Stargate, and no elements related to plot, or characterization, or team dynamic, or humor, or visuals, or internal consistency, or plot, then you might like this show. You won't. You won't like it. For the record, I am pleased that Stargate was considered such a viable franchise by MGM that they made these spin-off shows, like the Stargate Origins web series or the Stargate Infinity cartoon. I just wish that they would have done it in a more meaningful and well-constructed way and maybe consulted some of the original showrunners or the creative team from the series. Any anybody? I have a special tube for Major Gas Bonner. That's what she said. <laughs>